Well, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Garcia Guevara from the History Department and uh, Director for the Center for the Study of Human Rights. Uh, very glad to have all of you here, um, and uh, as well as our distinguished guests. A couple of notes of business for those of you who are in my class. There's a sign-in sheet in the front, so on your way out, you can go ahead and, and sign that. I also wanted to say a couple of things really quickly about the Amnesty International Student Group, uh, which uh, I am one of the co-advisors for. And uh, we've been active now for a couple of years on campus and are continuing to drum up support for issues surrounding human rights, not only internationally, as Amnesty International is, is often known for, but also locally. And uh, so I invite you all, anyone who is interested in finding out more, coming to a meeting. We'll be having one after spring break on the 24th. Also on your way out, there's a sign-in sheet there. You'll put down your name and your email address. We'll be in contact, and uh, we'd love to have some of you participate. All right, well, I just want to, since you're, you're not here to listen to me, I uh, want to move right on and introduce uh, Dr. Aviva Chomsky. Professor of History and Coordinator of Latin American Studies at Salem State College. Uh, she's the author. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yes, we are all universities now. Uh, the author of several books. She's been active in Latin American solidarity and immigrants' rights issues for over 25 years. We've actually had her here before. Uh, we're lucky to have her on campus uh, surrounding the issue of Colombian labor and human rights uh, regarding that. Uh, she's, uh, again, from Salem, Massachusetts, and is well-versed to speak on this topic, as uh, one of her latest books is They Take Our Jobs and 20 Other Myths About Immigration. I'd like to... Woo! Thank you guys so much for the invitation. It's really great to be here, and it's really exciting to see such a huge audience here. Happy birthday, Aldo. Uh, um, and happy International Women's Day to everyone. So I'm going to talk for about half an hour. Is that right? 20 minutes, OK. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, what I want to do here is give a little bit of background, a little bit of history, a little bit of context, but it won't be boring, I promise you. Everyone thinks it's going to be boring when you say you're going to give history, but this time it isn't. Um, because I think it's a history that's really, really crucial to understand what's going on with immigration today and also with some of the ideas that we have about immigration today. Um, so it's a, it's a history of the present, even though it's going to go back really far, it's going to cover some things really quickly to try to make sense of this particular historical moment that we're in and why immigration is the issue that it is today. Um, and the, the theme of the history that I want to give is inequality. That is, I want to talk about global inequality, how it came to be, what its nature is, and what it has to do with immigration. Um, and then I want to end by talking a little bit about um, how we've created some myths that help us justify global inequality, um, or at least think that we're justifying global inequality, and that we then use those myths to uh, perpetuate inequality. Um, I want to argue that the roots of today's global inequality go back about 500 years. Um, to colonialism. We can't understand global inequality without understanding colonialism. We also can't understand contemporary immigration without understanding colonialism. Um, but I want to look at three, uh, divide the last 500 years into three time periods so that we can sort of see how the global economic relations that developed in those three different time periods formed the world that we have today and the current situation with immigration that we have today. Um, so the first time period I would look at starts in 1492 and um, goes about until the middle of the 19th century. And I think in many ways um, people are familiar with some of the contours of this period, but maybe not in exactly the way I'm explaining them, and especially not with the direct relationship they have um, with our world today. So what are some of the characteristics of this first colonial period? I think we can call it colonialism one. Uh, from 1492 to the 19th century. 
It begins with European conquests in the Americas. So the Americas are incorporated into a global economic system or a world system, as we sometimes call it. Um, and they're incorporated in a very unequal way. That is, they're conquered by Europe, and they are uh, organized and set up to serve the purpose of extracting resources for the benefit of Europe's economy. Um, at the same time, Africa is incorporated into this global world system, um, this European-dominated world system. Um, and Africa is incorporated as a source of forced labor in this system. So people from Africa are transported to the Americas to work along with indigenous Americans under forced labor systems, the purpose of which is to extract resources for the benefit of Europeans. So we have the establishment of extractive economies, both in Africa and in the Americas. What's extracted from Africa is people. What's extracted from the Americas is resources, in particular precious metals, gold and silver, and sugar, all of which go to making a profit for Europe. So we go from a, a world where the various regions coexisted in a relative kind of equality into a highly unequal system where two regions are being depleted for the benefit of a third region. So that fits with what everybody kind of knows about colonialism, right? Um, so this, this system functions until sometime in the 19th century when it starts to shift and we move into what we could call colonialism two. In colonialism two, a couple of things happen. Um, the Americas become independent, starting with the Haitian Revolution, starting in 1791 through 1804, um, the US Revolution, 1775, 76, um, revolutions in other parts of Latin America. So by the end of the 19th century, uh, most of the American colonies have become independent. So that's one big shift in the colonial system. Um, another big shift in the 19th century is that first the slave trade and then slavery itself are abolished. So the slave system ends in the 19th century. Um, these shifts don't bring about equality in the world system, though. They, in fact, bring about even more inequality in the world system for a couple of reasons that I want to talk about. Um, first of all, when the slave trade ends, Africa is then colonized. So the Europeans lose their American colonies and they take over the entire continent of Africa. So Africa is now colonized. Um, at the same time, European colonialism expands through Asia, what we could call the peripheries of Asia, all the way through the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia, coastal China, so, so a whole new area is brought into this colonial world system. Um, third, the American colonies, except for the United States, continue to play exactly the same role in the global economy after independence that they did before independence. So formal independence doesn't mean equality, it means that the institutions that serve to use forced labor to extract resources from Latin America continue and even expand in the post-colonial period. New systems of forcing labor come into play um, with the abolition of slavery. Systems like debt peonage, systems like vagrancy laws, um, systems like taking people's land away from them so they have no choice but to work. Um, but in some ways, the biggest thing that changes in this uh, colonialism, too, is the Industrial Revolution. That is, the United States and Europe industrialize, and this means that they need a whole lot more products from their colonies and their former colonies, like Latin America. Um, instead of just gold and silver and sugar, now they start importing, using forced labor in their colonies um, and in their former colonies to produce all kinds of new 
metals that are necessary um, for, for the industrial process, things like tin and copper, um, eventually petroleum, so the extraction of natural resources, and new agricultural products that are necessary to feed the new industrial labor force. So we see the spread of things like coffee and bananas and products that are, again, still produced using various forms of forced labor in the colonies for the benefit of the colonial powers, now, which now include the United States. Um, so this is colonialism too. And note that I'm really emphasizing the role that labor plays, that forced systems of labor that force some people to work for the benefit of other people, force people in some regions to work for the benefit of people in other regions. Um, this colonialism too lasts until approximately the middle of the 20th century. And in, after World War II starts what I would call the period we're in now, maybe we can call it colonialism three. Um, and so, so I want to talk about some of the contours of colonialism three, what changes in colonialism three. Well, just as the Americas became independent at the end of colonialism one, almost all of the other colonies become independent at the end of colonialism two. So the African countries become independent, the Middle Eastern countries become independent, the peripheries of Asia become independent, all in the post-World War II period. But just as when Latin America became independent, formal independence doesn't change their position in the global economy. That is, they are still being forced to extract resources for the benefit of people in Europe and the United States. The industrialized countries, um, which over the course of the 19th through the middle of the 20th century, succeeded, based in large part on the extraction of resources from their colonies, um, but working people in the industrial countries, Europe and the United States, succeeded in raising their standard of living through government action, through popular struggles, through popular struggles that forced government action. Between the beginning of the 19th century and the middle of the 20th century, the standard of living for the working classes in Europe and the United States had risen dramatically. Um, but underlying that rise in living standards was the continued exploitation of labor and resources from what came to be known as the third world. So, in colonialism three, these industrialized countries, something very interesting starts to happen. They start to de-industrialize. Everybody's familiar with that, right? Factories start to close, move abroad. Where do the factories go when they close and move abroad? China. They go to China? Where else? India? Asia? Um, basically, they go to the former colonies. So we have the colonial system seeming to turn on its head. That is, the countries that were formerly industrialized are deindustrializing. The countries that were formerly not industrialized are now industrializing. And yet, the relationship of global economic inequality stays the same. That is, Places like the United States de-industrialize, send their factories abroad to take advantage of the systems that have been implemented in those former colonies that allow them to exploit land resources and labor there in ways they no longer can at home. Everybody following this? So, so the systems of inequality um, continue. Now, what does all this have to do with immigration? Um, I'd like to make the argument that in every time period, the people who have managed this system of global economic inequality, to their own benefit, of course, have created rationales and justifications that make it seem right to them that they should be doing this. Make it seem right to them that they should be colonizing, make it seem right to them that they should be exploiting, make it seem right to them that they should be using the resources of other people, making it seem right to them that they should be forcing the labor of other people. 
Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about these ideologies that Europeans and soon the United States, starting in colonialism too, have used to justify this inequality and their role in creating and maintaining this inequality. Um, in the first colonial period, one of the main rationales that Europeans used was religion. We have a superior religion, they said, therefore it's our duty to go spread our religion to everybody. Everybody who doesn't have the same religion as us has no right to belong to our society. In fact, we should enslave everybody who doesn't have the same religion as us. They're only here to be exploited by us. So starting in 1492, and certainly with the early colonialism in the United States as well, um, the Europeans who are colonizing identify themselves by their religion, and that theirs is a superior religion, and that is a justification for exploiting everybody else. Somewhere along the line during colonialism one, um, religion starts giving way to race as a justification. That is, especially as people of African and indigenous origin start converting to Christianity, and religion can't serve as a justification for exploiting them anymore, um, and as the Europeans start to identify themselves not only as Christians but as white, and the people who they are exploiting as non-white, um, race becomes a legal, political um, justification for exploitation of some people, for denial of rights for some people, for exclusion of some people, for maintaining a global system that's based on white people exploiting other people. And let me just say something about how this works out in US immigration law and policy. Who is included, who is excluded, who is exploited, and who is the exploiter. Um, that is, uh, through the entire 19th century, that is th through colonialism, the entire colonialism won, um, or say from the independence of the United States through the end of the 19th century, um, immigration status had nothing to do with one's status in the country. It didn't matter if you were an immigrant or if you were born here. What mattered was your race. U.S. citizenship law explicitly restricted citizenship to white people. It said nothing about whether you were born in the United States or not. If you were an immigrant and you were white, the day you got here, you had all the privileges of citizenship. You could vote. You could participate in everything. You could own land. Um, that is, it didn't matter whether you were born here or not. It only mattered whether you belonged to the correct race, whether you were put into the privileged category or the exploited category here. Um, in the same way, there were no restrictions on immigration um, during the colonial period or, or through the Civil War. There were no restrictions on immigration. Um, not only were people of color able to immigrate here with no restrictions, they were forced to immigrate here um, through the slave trade. Um, but once they were here, they were excluded in other ways because of the racial definition of the republic. Now this changes um, in the be through the 20th century. Um, race slowly starts to lose its legitimacy as a concept that Europeans can use to justify exploiting other people. This starts with the Haitian Revolution, really. It starts with, it continues with the abolition of the slave trade. Um, it continues with the Civil War in the United States. Um, and it's implemented in US law after the Civil War of the United States, when race can no longer be used as a reason for excluding people from citizenship. And after the Civil War, with the 14th Amendment, citizenship by birth is created. So race is eliminated, but something else is put in its place, birthplace, as a definition of who's allowed to have rights and who isn't. Um, along with the 14th Amendment comes a new naturalization law, 1870. Now naturalization is not restricted to whites. It's open to 
as the law says, white people and people of African descent. So we start to have moves to open up the law with respect to race. But those moves are very incomplete, as we all know. They still haven't been completed. But what I want to argue is that as race starts to retreat from the law, something else starts to take its place. And we see this most clearly in the case of the Chinese. That is, when the new naturalization law is passed in 1870, that says white people and people of African descent can become naturalized citizens in the United States. There, first of all, white people are immigrating in 1870 when this is passed, so this allows all of them to naturalize. Uh, people of African descent are not immigrating in the 1870s, in the aftermath of hundreds of years of enslavement, transportation, slavery. Um, there really isn't anybody in Africa who really wants to come to the United States in 1870. So, so that is there in the law more as a formality. Um, but people of Asian, people from Asia, are immigrating to the United States in large numbers in 1870. And they aren't included in this naturalization law. Is that a racial exclusion or is it a national exclusion? Congress isn't really sure. Um, they just know that, uh, that Chinese people can't be citizens of the United States. Is that because Chinese is a race? Or is it because Chinese is a nationality? That is, race starts to morph into nationality. And when the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed in 1882, we are hard pressed to say whether that's a racial exclusion or a national exclusion. That is, are Chinese excluded on the basis of their race or are they excluded on the basis of their nationality? So my argument is that over the course of the late 19th through the 20th century, nation state starts to rise as an ideological justification for discriminating and excluding people. So let me finish by applying that to where we are today with immigration and talking about Mexico in particular. That is, the entire economy of the United States is 100% dependent on exploited Mexican labor, both in Mexico and in the United States. Um, our fruits and vegetables, our clothes, um, our services, all of those are provided by Mexicans, whether in Mexico or in the United States. And US immigration law and the way it uses nationality as a rationale for exploiting and discriminating um, is our current method of justifying exploitation. That is, a factory moves to Mexico, cuts the wages that it pays its workers by a fact, you know, by 90%, uh, doesn't uh, obey environmental laws, doesn't obey health and safety laws, and they say, well, but that's, that's fine because it's in Mexico, it's not here. So we use the nation state as a rationale for, for justifying unequal treatment of people. Then we build a wall and we create this category of illegal people. That is, we say some people who are in this country or who come to this country to work don't have the same rights as everybody else because they were born in the wrong place. Because they were born in Mexico instead of being born here, that justifies exploitation. It justifies not paying the minimum wages. It justifies prohibiting them from having access to the benefits that this society offers to others. So we have, side by side, the United States and Mexico um, with a completely differential legal setup for treating people from the United States and Mexico. Um, and the resources of Mexico, over the course of hundreds of years of various types of colonialism, increasingly concentrated in the United States, but available only to non-Mexicans in the United States. Everybody still with me? Okay, I finished my 20 minutes, so I'm gonna end there, and um, I'll take questions afterwards. Thank you very much. We've only just begun. Uh, write those questions down, because we are saving time at the end that you can interact with the speakers. Our next speaker, Sue Schlatterbeck, is the director of 
cultural and language services at the Edward M. Kennedy Community Health Center, formerly known as Great Brook Valley Health Center. I first met Sue when she was sponsoring uh, workshops and forums on Worcester's newest immigrants. And uh, I knew that she is a person that really has her hands on what's happening here. What I didn't know is that she has a vast uh, background uh, working with refugees in the Sudan as a member of the International Rescue Committee. She worked there with Ethiopian refugees. In Thailand, working for the Catholic Office of Emergency Relief, she worked with Cambodian refugees. And with the US Peace Corps, in Kenya, she worked in community nutrition projects. And now, for the last 24 years, she has been here in Worcester working at um, the health center. She provides organization-wide leadership, not just in getting health services, but in providing help for the cultural and linguistic needs of the patients who come to the community health center. The idea is to reduce health disparities among these groups, a very, very important issue. So, Sue, so we're delighted that you can be here with us, and we look forward to your sharing. <laughs> I guess I thank you for the nice introduction. I realized after the introduction you could do the math and probably figure out how old I am. This is an age-integrated campus. Good. Um, uh, hopefully you can see the slides well enough. I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes, so I'm going to talk fairly quickly. Um, but I wanted to give you, oh good, this is great. Um, I wanted to give you a little overview about the health center. Um, we're on Tacoma Street as our main Worcester site. Many of you know us, knew us as Greater Valley Health Center. A definition of refugees and asylees. A little bit about the populations here in Worcester and the changes that we've seen recently. And then I have some uh, great resources for people who want to learn more information about these new communities. I brought some handouts of the presentation for people who would like them, and I also have my card. I'd be happy to email you the presentation. Uh, so basically, uh, the health center, we provide medical, dental, mental health, social services, optometry, everything at our site at Tacoma Street, and also we have sites in Framingham. Our staff speak 37 languages and come from 40 countries. And one of the priorities of the health center has really been to have our staff reflect the patients we serve. And I think they've done a very good, good job of that over the years. 77% of our staff are bilingual. We have over 300 staff and we have about 20,000, 22,000 visits. I mean, I'm sorry, 140,000 visits and about 22,000 patients who use the health center. We started providing <coughs> refugee health assessments in 1995, and then we received some other grants from the Office of Refugee and Immigrants to do some preventive health group work with refugee populations, which I'll talk about briefly. This is just the definition of a refugee and asylee, and I just think a lot of people um, aren't aware of what it means to be a refugee. Um, so it's any person who, owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted, is outside their country of or nationality and is unable or unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country or return to it. So they have to demonstrate fear of persecution due to either race, religion, membership to a social group, a political opinion, or a national origin. So most refugees um, have come into a neighboring country. The United Nations declares that they have refugee status due to this situation. Uh, asylees are pretty much like refugees. They have to be able to show um, the same fear, but usually asylee status is granted in this country. Somebody comes to this country and says that they have these reasons they can't return. This is just a little general data. Um, the census 2010 data, I'm sure everybody knows about, about that. The, the data really isn't out by city yet, so I can't really provide you with Worcester data by city, but this is five-year data from the American Community Survey, uh, which you can get on online. Uh, the population in Worcester, about 178,000. I just took a couple specifics to give you some information on Worcester in general. 31% report speaking a language other than English at home. 9.2% uh, uh, report that black or African-American for race 
Uh, this isn't broken down by country of origin, but we have a lot of um, people from different African countries living in the Worcester area. 5.3% Asian, largest Asian population in Worcester being the Vietnamese population, which represents 2.5% of the population. And then 18% identifying themselves as Hispanic or Latino of, of any race, uh, the largest being the Puerto Rican population, which is about 11%. Um, we could have long conversations about how this is collected and, and what this data really means, but <laughs> that'll be a, a whole other day's talk. So, um, This is what I really want to focus on is the refugee populations, because that's what I'm most familiar with, and we work a lot with refugees at the health center. In 2006, we had 107 new refugees coming into Central Mass. Uh, basically, by Central Mass, we're referring to Worcester. The only refugee population that settled really outside of Worcester were the Hmong, and the Hmong settled in the Fitchburg area. But otherwise, when you see Central Mass, Worcester is what I'm generally referring to. You can see the numbers increased. In 2009, we had two, 620 new refugees. Worcester became a really major area for resettlement of these new populations, and it was about 500 last year. The populations have shifted over time. Uh, if you look at the uh, data from 2006 to 2010, 32% uh, are Iraqis, 18% Bhutanese, 12% from Burma, 11% Liberians, and 20%, 27% other refugee groups. If I would have given you this talk in 2008, you wouldn't have seen any Iraqis or Bhutanese on this slide. This is all new, new arrivals um, to the Worcester area. I just put this slide up for people who might be interested in, in where, especially Bhutan, I think a lot of people aren't that familiar with Bhutan, which is um, over, it borders both uh, China and India, you can hopefully see it over there, I think it's in blue, um, Iraq, and then Burma in green, um, being the three countries with the largest refugee populations coming, coming here. In terms of things that affect refugee health, um, both physical health and mental health, I just wanted to um, mention a couple things. One is that um, when you work with refugee populations or you have neighbors who are refugees, there's a lot of things that have affected their lives, both from what existed in their home country, what happened during their flight, and then what existed during the, in, the, in the refugee camp. A lot of losses of social support, a lot of disruptions of families, a lot of lack of access to health care, lack of access to education um, that affects the health of refugees. These are the four voluntary agencies who are in Worcester right now. They're the groups that resettle refugees. They provide case management for the first 90 days. And so they're the ones who pick up the refugees at the airport, help them with housing, help them with um, job applications getting them connected with health care, English classes, and things like that. We run some groups at the health center. We actually run a lot of groups. We were able to get some extra funding uh, the last few years. We've run 142 groups uh, for over, with over 2,000 group contacts with refugees. And these groups have been great in terms of letting us learn more about new populations and also letting the new populations learn more about how our systems work here in this country. It also is getting a chance for people to be able to be together. And when people are resettled in Worcester, they don't resettle people in communities and neighborhoods. People live all over Worcester, and they can't necessarily get together as, as groups. So these, these sessions have been very powerful, both for us and I think for the communities who, who've attended. Uh, this just also gives you the uh, numbers, um, and this is, uh, again, uh, Worcester. It doesn't include secondary migration, people who were settled in other states and came to Worcester, but we've had 603 Iraqis and 343 Bhutanese, 226 refugees from, from Burma. And I just put up here the importance of not stereotyping and seeing each refugee as an individual. And, I just wanted to give a couple examples. One is uh, the Iraqi population resettling in Worcester. Uh, Iraqis, 97% of Iraqis are Muslim, but the Iraqis coming to Worcester, there's a large Mandaean community. Um, the Mandaeans believe in John the Baptist. They're a very small population in the world. There are only about 60,000 Mandaeans, and you have to be born into being a Mandaean. I, I, Worcester may be, I'm not sure, may be the largest population of Mandaeans in the country right now. But a lot of the Iraqis we're seeing are of this population. Uh, refugees from Burma, uh, they're 
let's see, I think it's Burma's divided into seven states. They have eight major ethnicities and then 145 other ethnicities. They speak many languages. Many people from Burma don't speak Burmese. The cultures are very different. So in learning about these populations, it is challenging because every, everyone is different. And just like, you know, I grew up in Detroit, I'm, I may be very different from someone who grew up in Worcester in terms of my, my background and my, and my culture of my family. Some challenges of refugees um, adjusting from rural to urban life. Uh, we've noticed this particularly with refugees from Burma and Burundi. We have large Burundian population who's resettled in the Worcester area um, coming from rural areas. Cultural and language barriers, mental health issues. A lot of people have either uh, witnessed or experienced violence um, themselves and are having to deal with that being separated from families. And employment needs being very challenging, how to fill out a job application, um, how, to, how to have an interview. And raising children in this country has also been brought up um, by a lot of the refugee groups as being challenging. There's not necessarily the same sense of community in the neighborhood um, in terms of being able to count on the people around you to help also watch out for your children. We have different rules and laws. Uh, understanding both our health system and our school system uh, fear of police also is very common because of people's prior experience and understanding our laws um, that we have uh, drinking while driving, um, domestic violence. We have a lot of laws that a lot of people aren't familiar with. Um, and then also um, exposure to a lot of modern amenities that we have and taking care of the elderly. I put this both as a uh, challenge and on the next slide is a strength because it's been brought up in a lot of the discussions that we've had with refugee populations is that they're really struggling because everyone in the house has to work who can work or they have to go to school and who's going to take care of the older person in the home. And it's a strength in that they really value the elderly um, in the cultures, but it's also a real challenge in terms of how to, how to be able to do that and take care of the elderly in our community here. Um, <clears throat> other strengths, um, very strong desire to work and get a good education. Um, the refugee populations tend to be very resilient eager to learn English and learn about the United States, have rich cultural backgrounds and a strong sense of community, and really want to have a good life for themselves and their children. A lot of people have skills coming here, and it's something that we've noticed particularly in the Iraqi populations. They uh, were doctors or lawyers in Iraq, and they come here, and you can't just transfer your education over easily. So it's a big challenge for people to kind of be able to get their education transferred. And some people who have had very professional roles overseas now are having to work at Dunkin' Donuts or McDonald's. And that, that also is a very stressful situation for, for a lot of people. Um, so I think that's pretty much, I think my 10 minutes, you know, if I <laughs> did that right, but I tried to time it. Um, these are resources. Um, this, uh, these two slides, this and the next one, the, the resources that are out there on the web are just fantastic in terms of learning about new populations. The RHIN uh, website, the first one I mentioned here, has information in all different languages. You can search by language, search by topic. Uh, the third one, the COR, Cultural Orientation Resource Center, you can, you can look at all the background information on refugees from Burma, Somalia, Liberia. They have very good documents. Uh, this next slide... Um, the first one, this is um, uh, Global Health at University of Minnesota. They actually have some great lectures on, that you can actually go on and, and view the lectures on different refugee populations. So I highly recommend um, searching some of these things because there's, there's so much to learn and it's very interesting. And that's it. So thank you. <laughs> those questions down. It feels like this should be a three-day seminar. <laughs> Our next speaker, Sarang Sakabat, is from MIRA, which is the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition. And they are a marvelous group who have been hard at work for many, many years in New England, promoting the rights and the integration of immigrants and refugees. They serve over one million foreign-born residents, and they do important things like policy analysis. They do advocacy. They do institutional organizing. They do training. They do leadership. And they do strategic communications. It has an active membership of over 130 organizations. 
And um, I can speak from experience in uh, connecting with Mira uh, several years ago when the church community I'm a part of uh, was uh, giving sanctuary uh, to uh, a person from El Salvador. And now we are giving sanctuary uh, to some people from the Cameroon. And the connection with Mira has always been very, very helpful and um, very important. They are very active here in the Worcester area as well. So, Saran, if you want to come, he's... Um, his family is from Iran, and he is born here. Thanks for that great introduction. I don't know if I give us quite as much praise as you did, but I'll take it. Um, so I'm here actually to talk about a federal program called Secure Communities. A um, little bit of background. Our immigration system is broken. Pretty much everybody agrees on that. Uh, the difference, uh, the debate is really about how you fix it. Some people say uh, we need enforcement only programs, and some people talk about a comprehensive approach that provides a, a pathway to legalization for the vast majority of the people who are here. The problem with the enforcement only approach is that we are already spending about $15 billion a year on enforcement to deport about 400,000 people every year. Um, if you do the math, you see it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time to be able to actually do enforcement only approaches. It's just not realistic. Uh, and even when you calculate that out, you're assuming um, first off, that no one knew is coming into the country, which we know is not going to be true. Uh, and second off, you're also assuming that you're getting the same bang for the buck. That is, back in the 80s, it used to cost about a third what it costs now to deport one individual. Um, as we've seen constant uh, flows of money into enforcement, we've seen a very steep drop in how much that actually buys. Um, so enforcement only policies, this is my advocacy side, Enforcement only policies really, they're simply not realistic. Uh, we need a different approach. What Secure Communities is, um, it's aimed, it's advertised as a criminal enforcement program. Um, now for those of you who don't realize, and frankly we've got a lot of politicians who don't understand this, immigration is a civil issue, it's not criminal. Uh, someone who is currently undocumented into the country is not a criminal. Um, you always hear people saying, well, hey, they're all criminals. Well, actually, they're not. According to the law, they're not criminals. Um, but what Secure Communities does is try to apprehend criminal aliens. Um, and to explain how it does this, I'm actually going to take a step back and, and talk about how things work without Secure Communities. Some of you might have gotten this diagram um, in black and white. This shows basically what happens with and without secure communities. Uh, the dashed line here is without secure communities. What happens is that a local law enforcement agency is going to arrest someone. When they arrest someone, could be before they even file charges, they're going to take their fingerprints. Those fingerprints are then sent to a state agency, sent on to the FBI, which will check against the database whether uh, there are any outstanding warrants anywhere, any other issues, also verify the person's identity just any other issues around uh, a suspected criminal. You see the dash line goes right back down, goes back to that state agency, which then sends that information onto the arresting law enforcement agency. With secure communities, what happens is that the FBI is now adding a second database. This is a civil database. It's called the IDENT. It's uh, maintained by the Department of Homeland Security. So now when someone gets arrested, they're going to run it the FBI will run it against the civil database as well. If there's a hit, that information is then sent on to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, an agency within Homeland Security. Uh, they will verify the person's status, forward the information on both to the local law, or sorry, both back to the FBI and on to their local office, uh, which will then determine whether they're basically going to arrest someone. Um, the local office will issue what's called a detainer if they want to hold someone. Uh, this is basically a, a non-binding request to the local law enforcement agency to hold someone for 48 hours. Uh, it could be as much as five days because that 48 hours does not include holidays or weekends. Uh, so you imagine if it's a three-day holiday, 
uh, three day weekend, someone could be held for a long time. And that's assuming that they're actually going to hold to the limit, which not everyone does. Sometimes they'll hold them for longer than they're legally allowed to. Um, so like I said, it kind of makes sense when you see, the, see it on the surface. This is aimed at criminal activity. Uh, you're checking people who've been arrested. The problem is not everyone arrested is actually a criminal. Um, there's a reason we have trials. And to give you an idea of uh, how the program works, we have secure communities in Boston. This is a chart that's a little small. I can't, Fred, you can't see it all too well. Um, this purple part, the bigger part, represents 53% of the people who've been deported because of secure communities in Boston. Uh, that 53% are actually non-criminal. They have no convictions against them. Yet they're being deported because of a criminal, what's supposedly billed as a criminal law enforcement program. Um, a couple quick things, because there's a lot of confusion about secure communities. I'm not sure anyone's more confused than the federal government themselves about how this program works. Um, but a few things that it isn't. Um, there's a program called 287G which essentially deputizes law enforcement, local law enforcement, to act as immigration officials. Secure Communities does not do that. Your local officer is not going to come up to you and ask you uh, to prove your legal status. They're just going to arrest you. Um, same thing, uh, SB 1070, the Arizona law that's generated so much um, controversy, uh, sort of similar to 287G, it allows officers to actually ask people what their immigration status is. Again, Secure Communities does not do that. But what it does do is open the door for racial profiling. Um, even in Massachusetts, we do have this problem. Um, local police officers, and it just takes one, uh, the department can have a great policy against racial profiling, but it only takes one officer to go into a community actually racially profile and then you're scaring the entire community. No one wants to talk to the police. We've already had this problem happen um, even in jurisdictions where we don't have secure communities. We've had issues with the state police where there have been uh, suspicions of racial profiling and the whole community was terrified for an entire county. No one wanted to talk to the state police. Um, so that's the basics of secure community. Um, What's going on right now in Massachusetts, for those of you who haven't heard, in December the governor's office made an announcement that they were going to make secure communities statewide. This kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, governor Patrick had been campaigning against, he had been campaigning on the fact that he would not sign on to secure communities. Um, and so he made this, this announcement. Everyone was kind of shocked to know what was going on. Uh, we talked to them, got them to hold off. They're now going to conduct a bunch of community meetings around the state. The first one was in Worcester about a week and a half ago. Um, and there's going to be nine more, possibly a couple more, um, that will go all the way through July. And the idea is for the, the governor's office to hear about what the impact would be on the community. And it's a devastating impact. Um, like I said before, People are scared to talk to the police, even without secure communities. Everyone's afraid of law enforcement. Part of that is because in their home countries, law enforcement maybe is not the most uh, honest um, agencies in the world uh, or in the country. Um, but it's also just a lot of confusion. People already, you're coming to the country, you don't understand the difference between state and federal law enforcement. You don't understand that your local police officer is not going to arrest you for being undocumented. You're still not going to talk to them. Um, so what we're, we've already have problems with people being afraid of talking to the police and secure communities really exacerbates that problem. Uh, a couple of things we've already seen, um, victims of domestic violence, very often the abuser will file or will make a counterplan against the abused and this will result in both of them being arrested. With secure communities, you're now in a situation where a woman who's a victim of abuse, or a man who's a victim, anyone who's a victim of abuse, could now be deported simply for reporting that abuse. Um, we had a situation, a woman was rear-ended. The driver of the other car actually assaulted her after rear-ending her. She was terrified to call the police 
because of secure communities. Would not do it. Wasn't even in a jurisdiction where secure communities was active. But because of her fear of this program, she refused to talk to the police. Um, one other thing I should point out is that secure communities splits suspected criminals or convicted criminals into three levels. Level one being the most severe, level three being the least severe. Um, again, if you look at this chart of uh, Boston deportations, only about 23% of those who are level one, or of those deported were level one um, offenders. Again, for a, a program that's touted as getting rid of the, the worst of the worst, of getting rid of the people who pose a threat to our communities. Um, it's a program that just, it's not producing what is promised. Um, and instead, it's, it's ruining efforts at community policing, it's destroying trust, um, and it's frankly making people a lot less safe. The people who are, people in the communities are now afraid of the people who are supposed to be protecting them. Um, and so that's, really what happens with secure communities. Um, I will answer questions at the end. I do want to make one quick little plug. Uh, as part of our work every year, we have an annual um, advocacy day in the State House. It's coming up April 6th, and we rely a lot on our members and our allies to help us out. One of our best members is uh, the Worcester County chapter of the ACLU, and they are organizing buses April 6th to the State House for anyone who wants to come. I got a bunch of these little flyers. Uh, with information, you can just email the local chapter and uh, get a free ride out to Boston to, the, to the yell and stop around in the state house. Thanks a lot. I hope we've generated more questions than it's possible to answer in a short time because that means that you really are getting into wrestling with how challenging a topic this is. I'm going to ask you when you raise your hand to direct the question to one of the three speakers and we'll just let it flow. So, who would like to ask a question? Please. To stand and speak loudly. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, probably anyone who wants to ask. Uh, I'm very interested in the city of Worcester having, I guess through this university, sponsoring what I would call social occasions for speaking English. So if anyone could pick up on that, I think the problem is that when you learn English as a second language, you take classes, you still don't have any way to really pick up a lot of nuances, a lot of things. I think it would be extremely helpful for us if they had absolutely free classes at various universities, just simply not classes, but I mean sessions, or coffee, tea, whatever, so people could just simply see. I think it would be very helpful. What does anybody do? Um, do I need a mic or can you hear me okay? I'll use the mic. I actually um, think it's a great idea. There's really a lack of um, English classes in Worcester right now. And the literacy volunteers at uh, the library uh, is always looking for volunteers and they link them with people who are learning English to help one-on-one -on -one tutoring and sometimes they have some group events too for the tutors and the students. But I think that if the universities could take a role in offering this, it would be great. I actually myself volunteered as a tutor and uh, I know how hard it is for someone to just have one day a week of English class because what people really need to do is have more time to practice often. So I think I think that would be great if the universities got involved. So maybe we'll just make it start. Well, we already have an immigrant tutoring program for adults and elders who come on campus one day a week. And our stu and you, any of you students are welcome to just see me. We're always looking for tutors. And all you have to do is speak English. And, um, and we also tutor it at um, 425 Pleasant Street. We bring them. But in terms of just social events, we try to welcome immigrants to come to events on campus, um, but that's at least, we have one foot, one foot in the door there, yes. Another question. Yes. Um, I was very puzzled um, by the large number of people from Bhutan. I mean, you don't hear about famine or civil war. What are they running from? Well, actually, it, it's, a, it's a good question, because I think Bhutan is one of the only countries with a, a ministry of peace. And, and uh, 
Yes, and happiness index. Um, but there's a little unhappiness uh, going on in Bataan, too. Uh, there, these, uh, the refugees are people who are ethnically Nepali. And basically, the government of Bhutan uh, decided that you had to prove that you had been a citizen of uh, Bhutan for many years. And the people who were ethnically Nepali didn't have the paperwork. They had a one-day demonstration. There was It's kind of a long story, but they ended up going into Nepal, settling in refugee camps. And now the United Nations has recognized them as refugees who cannot return to their home country and the government of Nepal is not allowing them to stay there, so they're being reset. I see. So they're an ethnic minority. They're an ethnic minority, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, in your opinion, the best way of dealing with illegal immigrants who have spent thousands of dollars in years trying to become legal? And if so, uh, whatever you, you, you say is, is the best thing, what if they have uh, children in the United States who are Americans? Should they be deported? Should, what, what, sh what should be done with this? Because obviously the federal uh, government's not really taking care of it. Um, so, um, let's see, I don't even know where to begin in answering that question. Um, I don't think that the category illegal should ever have been invented. I think it's a category that was created in order to justify mistreatment, discrimination, exploitation. Um, and so the real solution, I think, is um, to abolish the whole notion of illegality and the idea that some people should be illegal. Um, that's a long-term goal because clearly given the current world order and domestic order, it's not going to happen um, between today and tomorrow. Um, however, we have seen other legally enshrined forms of exclusion and discrimination abolished after years of struggle. So I think we should be openly talking about the fact that we should not create a country that has different statuses and that assigns people to different statuses and treats them differently based on the status we've assigned to them. I mean, I, I really firmly believe that and I think it's uh, long ago we should have started talking about it and we should be talking about it all the time now. Um, at the same time, um, I think that there are, are small steps that we can take given the current conditions, um, to try to lessen the exclusion, exploitation, and discrimination that people without documents are subjected to. Um, and some of them have been mentioned here, uh, like doing away with laws like secure communities, for example, would be one way of taking a small step, or in the case of Massachusetts, preventing us from signing on to secure communities, because that's a law that's going to further entrench mistreatment of immigrants. So we want to stop moving in that direction. Um, there's a couple of pieces of legislation that are currently up for discussion. Um, one of them has to do with in-state tuition. That is uh, currently federal law based on a Supreme Court decision from 1982 requires that public education through secondary school, through the 12th grade, has to be available to everybody regardless of immigration status. So calling somebody illegal cannot be used as a way to deprive them from going to school. Um, it can be used as a way to deprive them from going to college, though. So the in-state tuition law um, basically grants people who are undocumented uh, the right to be considered state residents and pay in-state rates at, uh, at institutions of higher learning. Um, 11 states in the United States have that kind of law. We don't have it here in Massachusetts. So that would be some, and that's actually going to be coming up in the next legislative session in Massachusetts. It's come up before. It's never, it actually did pass the legislature and was then vetoed by the governor a number of years ago. Uh, so that's something we can look at coming up in the immediate future. Um, another issue that I think is really uh, up for discussion in the immediate future is driver's licenses. That is, until the middle of the 2000s, um, people who are undocumented could get driver's licenses. Now, in most states in the United States, because of the Real ID Act, they can't. Some states, like New Mexico, have refused to abide by the Real ID Act. 
they say is unconstitutional, and we're going to continue giving driver's licenses to people who are undocumented. Um, the coalition in Massachusetts, which includes Vera, that put together the New Americans agenda, which Deval Patrick supposedly liked, um, one of their recommendations was to um, create a way for people to get driver's licenses, regardless of their documentation status. Um, Deval Patrick, uh, unfortunately, he, he said that he uh, loved the New Americans agenda, but when people questioned him specifically, well, are you going to support in-state tuition? One of the items, are you going to support driver's licenses? He said, well, uh, I don't know if we can really do that because uh, it might cause problems for us at the federal level. Well, he's the governor. He should know that other states have done it. Um, I, I just get so annoyed when I hear our elected representatives uh, not having any idea what's going on in the realm of the law. But uh, it gets, I'm not surprised that, that most of us don't know, but our, our lawmakers should know.